we know nothing of suffering. Um, Socioeconomically, even the poor of us is, is better than two-thirds of the world. Even the poorest of us. Um, we don't risk anything coming to church. We have had people here that uh, have faced difficulties, even might, might even call it some persecution, um, because their families, you know, they came out of other churches and other places. Um, but really, the most of us, we struggle to decide whether or not we're going to come based on uh, what we have going on or how we feel. <clears throat> if you have your Bible, open to Matthew chapter 5. If you will note, uh, most of you should have in your bulletin uh, a prayer card. If you don't have one, uh, let me know. They only sent a limited amount this time. I can give more. But inside this card, there is a, a form for you to fill out. And Voice of the Martyrs will send you a picture and a name of a pastor in a persecuted country for you to pray for. We have three that we pray for in our house. Um, the names are most likely not their real names. And you don't share this in any media at all. Because this gets out on the internet, uh, the picture or the name of the person, and that you are putting their lives at risk. Okay? But I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to commit to praying every day. I hope you're praying every day for the persecuted church, the bride of Christ, but to pray specifically for a pastor that is in a field that faces jail, that faces abuse, that faces being ostracized, not just in his community, but oftentimes even by their own family. And face his death. So, there are two things. If you tear this in half, you'll have a bookmark to help you to remember to pray. And then the card that you can send in and get a name of a pastor to pray for. Um, so I would challenge you, if you don't, if you didn't get a card, let me know. I will get you some cards, okay? Um, all right, so I'm going to hit a couple of scriptures here, and I want you to kind of detect the flow if you haven't already. So in uh, Matthew chapter 5, this is the Sermon on the Mount, and... Uh, Jesus is sharing with several thousand people, we believe. Um, when we were in Israel, we got to see the area that this happened in. Um, odd tidbit just for you to file away in that place where you keep stuff that you have really no use for. Um, this is on the north edge of the Sea of Galilee. And... Um, the sea comes up, there's a little bit of a flat spot, and then it goes up into a, a small mountain, a large hill, small mountain. And um, it is thought that Jesus actually stood in the flat area because uh, standing up on the mountain, he would have to use his voice in opposition to the wind and, and the sound of the lake. <laughs> Whereas if he stood down at the bottom, he would not have to speak very loudly 
but the natural amplification by the place that he's standing would carry his words up onto the mountain to the people that were listening. There, stick that in your pocket somewhere and someday impress somebody with some trivia. So, if you have your Bible, we're going to pick up. Um, we're going to start, let's see, I'm going to start back up in verse 7. Um, Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God Oh, you know what? It would help if I was in chapter 5. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was looking at that. Well, that's not what I wrote down. Okay, um, we're actually going to start in verse 2. This is the Beatitudes. Uh, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, you know, there's nothing in Scripture that is not there for a purpose. But sometimes i got to wonder what the purpose is. And he opened his mouth. That, to, me, to me, that just seems like the normal thing to do when you're talking. Yeah. You open your mouth. Although, I, I do know some people. My oldest son, Christopher, he doesn't need to open his mouth. All the words come out in this continuous stream. And I keep telling him, move your lips and the words will have meaning. <laughs> it was actually uh, a, a little unfortunate because we had to wait for his younger brother to come along to interpret for us what he was actually saying. <laughs> so, and he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you, and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Now, if we left right there, that's still a good place, isn't it? To be blessed. Just out of curiosity, is there anyone in here that doesn't want to be blessed? Please put your hand up. <laughs> If we left right there, being blessed, wouldn't that be great? But God doesn't stop there. He goes on, Jesus in the next verse says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, when you are persecuted. Let's let, uh, has anyone in here been persecuted by their faith? And, and that can mean anything. It can be um, uh, you got ostracized. Uh, for example, uh, we had a teacher in eighth grade science, Mr. Meadows. Um, this is a long time for, ago for most of you. For some of you, it was just yesterday. Um, Mr. Meadows taught science, and he had a section in his uh, curriculum that was on evolution, okay? And um, I had, the, the school that I went to, uh, there were a number of band notes, my siblings and, and cousins, uh, and then we're related to several other families, the Wards, uh, the Souzas, the Dyes, uh, the Scribners, so there were a lot of, of family in, in that small school. Um, and my oldest brother, Scott, uh, he was uh, offended by the position that Mr. Meadows taught on evolution. And so he challenged Mr. Meadows. He said, if, if you're going to teach on evolution, I would like equal time to create, uh, teach on creation. And Mr. Meadows kind of laughed him off, thinking, you know, who's this eighth grade kid going to... Well, Scott actually did his work, and he came up with... with uh, a lesson to teach, and um, nothing actually ever came of it. Okay, um, when he came and he presented his lesson plan, uh, they pretty much, Mr. Meadows, pretty much just stopped. Well, a couple years later, um, my next brother Todd uh, had Mr. Meadows, and he, when Mr. Meadows got to that section, 
Todd did the same thing and he challenged him and, and again, nothing came of it. Um, then the next year, uh, I had Mr. Meadows and I was ready. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's, sometimes it's a good thing to have a lot of family that goes to the school in front of you. Sometimes it's not such a good thing uh, because uh, in the grade above me is my brother Todd and also my cousin Jeff. And uh, Jeff was uh, quiet and studious and, and uh, Todd was, he, he had gifts in other areas. Um, study was not one of them. And so, uh, unfortunately, Todd and Mr. Meadows had more than one run-in, uh, including a time when Todd went out on the recess and he was supposed to go to Mr. Meadows to serve detention. And he had to be physically picked up and carried in. Now, I told you his gifts are in other places. Um, the next year, me and my cousin Joni have Mr. Meadows. I always hated the first day of school. I always hated it. Not just because, you know, your summer's over and you got to start everything new and all of everything's new, but uh, every one of the teachers would ask, okay, so are you Jeff's brother or Todd's brother? And Joni would be like, I'm Jeff's, Jeff's my brother. And I'd be like, yeah, Todd. <laughs> invariably, invariably, the teacher would go, okay. <laughs> they never did that for Joni, just just me. Okay, so my year comes along. We get to that section. I'm ready. Um, I've already done my, my research. I've pulled together uh, lesson plans. And uh, he says, the only thing I'm going to say about evolution is that it is simply change. And that was all that was said. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no idea what happened when my sister and my younger brother came through. Quite honestly, when he saw there were more band notes, he probably retired. <laughs> uh, so, um, I want to I want to look at this for just a second. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Remember, there's nothing in there without purpose. Falsely is there for a reason. Look, if people are going to curse you and revile you because you're a jerk. You don't fit in this category. This is not you. As a matter of fact, we see in a, a number of the epistles, uh, Paul and Peter both write that, uh, you know, hey, if, if uh, you're getting abused because you're a jerk, that's your fault. But if you're getting abused because you are serving God and you are representing God, God honors that, okay? So if they are saying these things falsely about you. So... Um, that's the first point I want to make, is that it's got to be real. It's got to be true, okay? And then it follows up with, on my account. So it's not just whether you're true or false, but who you are representing. When you say these things, are you representing Christ? Are you representing his bride, the church? Or are you representing yourself? The persecution equals blessing is only if you are truthfully being his witness, okay? Uh, verse 12, rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, uh, you think about some of the prophets that came before him, uh, before us, looking back over the annals of time, uh, we know that there was a lot of abuse for the prophets. Oftentimes they were uh, killed, executed. Uh, I believe it was Zechariah that was actually sawn in half. Um, even moving up through what we would consider more current history, uh, you look at men like um, William Tyndale. Does everybody know who William Tyndale is? Mm -hmm. Okay, he, he was uh, technically, I guess, the second uh, person that wanted the Bible to be in the reader's native language, and, and the language that he was writing for was English, okay? Um, he uh, translated out of the Vulgate and into English, and at that time, it was actually illegal to translate into English. You, you, you were not supposed, that was the premise. That was the sole concern of the church, and specifically the church Catholic, and you, you know, that was the area of separation. We've talked about how now there is no separation between the clergy and the laity, but we are all priests, right? Uh, 
this was one way that the clergy made themselves different. They were the ones that got the teaching to be able to read and therefore interpret the scriptures to uh, the lay people. So William Tyndale started this translation and, and out of his work comes most of the modern uh, translations, the uh, NIV, the ESV, uh, but they have the added advantage of actually having original manuscripts to work from. Uh, William Tyndale was actually um, executed because of his translation. Uh, there's a gentleman, uh, I can't remember his first name, his last name is Monmouth. He was actually a businessman that underwrote all of Tyndale's works. And he also, as Tyndale would finish sections, uh, this gentleman had a large fleet of ships. He would take copies of, of Tyndale's work and he would distribute them all throughout English-speaking countries. Um, now, Tyndale was uh, executed. He was strangled and then burned in a fire. Um, if you ever have the opportunity, I would highly encourage you to read Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, there's a number of new editions out that are really, uh, they're humbling and they're encouraging, okay? So, believing is great, exhibiting faith, but there is a faith that is not unto salvation. Um, if you are going to speak forth the things of God, if you are going to speak truthfully the things of Jesus Christ, You've, you've got to know what they are. One of the greatest proofs of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the amazing transformation of his followers. Okay? Uh, you look the day that Jesus died, you had Peter denying him, uh, Judas run off and, and uh, hanged himself. Um, the rest of the disciples went into hiding and for three days they uh, were only going out in secret. Uh, fearing for their lives, fearing the authorities. And then on that third day, Jesus rose. And then you see men, you get into the book of Acts, as Jesus is taken up into heaven, something ignites inside of these men. And they are bold beyond rational thinking. Okay? Peter gets hauled in. Peter and John. And they're told, hey, you've got to stop saying these things. They say, well, you, we can't. We have to obey what God tells us to do. And he's told us to tell these things. And so they were beaten, probably the, the 39 strikes. Um, and they were set free. And they left. And they left how? Rejoicing. They left rejoicing. So you see, that's, that's what this is talking about right here. See, now, when, when Paul and John, or Peter and John were, were hearing this message, and we know they were there, uh, because it talks about them talking with Christ afterwards. Um, <clears throat> Rejoice and be glad in heaven. Or be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. He's telling, Jesus is telling them this three years in advance. Hey, you know, things are going to get tough and they're going to be hard and when they come against you because you are saying these things and you are doing these things rejoice now quite honestly I can see Peter sitting there going <laughs> no I don't think so but that marvelous transformation when he saw his Lord living again that death had no hold on his master. Something changed inside of him. Okay? And he spoke boldly. Boldly. And he refused to deny Jesus. Okay? So, okay. All right. What is the normal Christian life? And I'm, I'm not talking about the series of uh, messages uh, that... Uh, Oh, gosh, I don't He wrote the book, The Normal Christian Life. Nobody's read it? Trust me. It's been written. I just can't remember the author's name. It's sitting by my chair in the living room. That's it. Not ye. Ye. Yes. I got something that I want you to look at today. Okay? 
Uh, I'm just going to hit a couple more verses, and then I've got something that I want you to take away from this. Um, Luke chapter 6 uh, essentially says the same thing. Verses 22 and 23 says, Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Now, Luke, uh, who was most likely not there when this was said, uh, we know he did an incredible amount of research, talking with eyewitnesses and getting first-hand accounts to bring together a cohesive story. Uh, he, he says this a little bit differently because the next passage, rejoice in that day. Okay, that's what Matthew says, rejoice. All right. But then he says, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for so their fathers did to the prophets. Now, um, I, I, I tend not to be an overly uh, excitable person, uh, but back in 2001, uh, the Colorado Avalanche uh, were in the Stanley Cup Finals uh, against the New Jersey Devils, and um, I think it was game six. Um, no, it had to be earlier. It must have been the semifinals. Uh, it looked like the Avs were going to lose another game, and that would put them in a pretty hard spot. And just out of nowhere, uh, Joe Sackett snipes one of his patented twisted wristers and scores a goal, and, and the Avs uh, have got the game. And I jumped up with my hands above my head and put my hands right in the ceiling fan. Goom, 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 goom. Yay! <laughs> now, I jumped because I was excited. Heck, yes, I was. Okay. How many of you actually watch hockey? Yes. You guys know what I'm talking about. Okay. The rest of you, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, yeah that, that's about your only hope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but when we get excited, what do we do? Okay. About the most excitement that I, you really normally will ever see on me is I'll bounce on my toes. Okay. When you see me bouncing on my toes, you know I'm trying to keep everything restrained. All right. So, you know, just, just lay a hand on and pray and move on. All right. So, we are not just to rejoice. Our rejoicing should be bringing out a physical change of what we're doing. I don't get it. I've never been persecuted to that measure. Uh, I, I did suffer a little bit of contention through school um, because when I believe something, I, I hold fast to it. I won't let uh, people change me. Um, but we were doing a Bible study uh, in, in school in our, our uh principal came by and told me that uh, I, I was not supposed to be doing that at school. I think he used the word proselytizing. Um, and I asked him if there was a particular rule that said we couldn't share scripture, that we couldn't read scripture together on our lunch hour. And he said, no, but I'm, I'm not, I don't like it. That was all that was said. He didn't, he didn't write me up. He didn't bring me to his office. He didn't take me out of school. That was all that was said. And so that's about as, as bad as my persecution gets. Um, but I, I have a hard time wrapping my mind around uh, being beaten, being put in prison. Um, some of the stories that you hear are absolutely horrific. Uh, if you ever want to get some insight into what's going on in the world, I would encourage you to read The Heavenly Man. Uh, it's written by Brother Yoon, or actually it's his story, it's written by another man, uh, it's the story of Brother Yoon. <coughs> when you are in the moment, God gives you everything you need in that moment. Uh, Corey Ken Boom tells the story, she was going uh, on a trip, a train trip with her father, and she uh, asked him what a sex sin was. And her father was quiet for a while. And he, they, they went through and they, they gave their ticket, or they got on the train and the conductor came and tore their tickets. And after that was done, uh, her father turned to her and said, uh, Corey, 
when do I give you your ticket? And she said, well, when the conductor's coming to get it. He said, why do I wait to give you the ticket until that point? He said, because I'm afraid I'll lose it. You're afraid I'll lose it and, and I won't have it to give to the conductor. And he very wisely, I think he was very profound in how he dealt with this, he said, um, that is my answer to what is a sex sin. You're not ready for it. When the time comes and you're ready, then we'll talk about it. I think that is an incredibly caring father who understands not only the workings of this world, but also uh, the workings of the, the, the rearing of children in a godly home. Okay? Um, in the moment we need it, it's there. Just as Corey had to wait for the conductor to come to get her ticket and, and pass it on, um, a lot of times I believe that persecution is coming in the church in America. Um, I think it will probably happen in the next 20 years. It will start ramping up. That's my own personal belief. Uh, I, I don't go home and write on your calendar, you know, 2039, Pastor Glenn said, you know, that, I'm just saying, I believe the direction this country is heading, um, we will start seeing much more persecution against people that hold to faith in spite of what the culture says. So um, in that moment, should that come, God will give us everything we need to face it. Okay? And when he gives us everything that we need to face it, I guarantee you, I'll be bouncing on my toes. I might even jump. I'll check for ceiling fans first. Okay. The normal Christian life, I'm just going to hit this one last thing and then we're going to wrap everything up. Um, 2 Timothy, put there with me, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now this is Paul writing to his son in the Lord. <clears throat> and it's much like a spiritual father giving instruction to the spiritual son. And he's trying to prepare him for the work that's coming. Paul knows that his ministry, his time on earth is coming to an end. And he's <clears throat> passing along to the up and coming generation, those who will leave the church after he and his generation are gone. He's trying to give them everything that they need. And so, uh, <clears throat> chapter 3, I'm going to pick up in verse 10. Uh, you, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. Okay, so all of these things, I mean, if, if you're answering yes to all of these, are you doing these, then, then that's great. But, but then we go to the next verse, and it says, My persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from all the Lord rescued me. Now, just a real quick history lesson. Um, when Paul took the first missionary trip, uh, trip with Barnabas, he went through uh, the area that is known as Galatia, uh, and these are the series of churches that if you read in Acts, he went to each one of those churches, and the persecution uh, followed him from the previous city. Uh, and then in verse 12, he says something that I think should set sirens off in our heads. Uh, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and, and impersonators will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he, he kind of brings this thought to an end. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, uh, equipped for every good work. But verse 12, look at that. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now, I, I don't think that means that every Christian throughout all of history from that <coughs> moment until Christ returns is going to face persecution of, of uh, the same sort. Um, I, I think there's going to be different measures. And, and right now, we in America, we're in an incredibly grace-filled 
time. But as we see these things start to shift, uh, I believe that we're going to see a great winnowing out of the church in America. I think I think the, the people that are in there because it's culturally acceptable or because mom or dad or wife or husband said they need to be there uh, or, or whatever rationale, um, I think we're going to see a lot of them fall away and, and move out from the church and what will be left will be the true bride of Christ. Um, now, I believe persecution is coming. Uh, I've already got my cell marked down at the jail. Um, I've got reservations in there. And there's room for several more, so um, you know, you're welcome to go with me when this happens. Um, there are things that the church cannot accept uh, in the world system. And one of these days, we are going to have to make a public determination as to which we are going to follow, which, which we're going to follow. We're going to, we're going to bow down in, into the world and we're going to follow as the culture says, or we're going to stand up like, like Paul writes in Ephesians 4, um, when we've done all that we know to do, we stand. Uh, if we stand up, we're going to stick out like a sore thumb because we're going to be different. We should be different. We are different. Okay. So uh, real quick, I want to wrap this all together. First, Persecution is increasing all over the world. Uh, India is ramping up significantly uh, persecution by the Hindi and the, against the Muslims and the Christians. Uh, we see that the persecution in China has again ramped up over the last two years. Uh, State-sponsored uh, arrests and imprisonments, destruction of churches um, has, has again been on the rise. Um, just real quick, and, and if I already told you this, you can't answer. Uh, where is the fastest growing church in the world? <clears throat> Iran. Iran. The Iran, you know, with the Ayatollah Khomeini. You're talking about Christian church? Christian church. Now, I'm not saying it's the biggest. I'm saying it's the fastest growing. Okay? Um... God is doing incredible things in the Muslim world. God is, there are signs and wonders being demonstrated in North Africa and all throughout the Middle East, uh, going down into Malaysia. Um, God is doing incredible things. When the church of Christ comes under persecution, it grows, it thrives, it spreads. I think that's why the church in the United States is not growing or diminishing. Okay? We, we don't know what to fight for. There's, there's nobody to fight with. Okay? Um, so first, I challenge you, be in prayer for the bride of Christ across the world. Okay? Second, I would encourage you to get involved in some way to keeping up with what is happening in the world. Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, open Doors, uh, there's a number of other ones that you can, um, Asian Harvest, uh, Gospel for Asia, you, you, you get in touch with these people, start reading their newsletters, you will see the things that are happening all over the world, okay? So get informed, let that uh, direct your prayers. I would also encourage you, get one of those cards, fill out, get a person that is ministering in a, a hostile country and pray for that person every day, every day. I, uh, I have my little rubber band here. Um, I commit to pray. Um, every morning, I have this sitting on my nightstand, and when I pick it up, underneath it is a picture of, of one of the pastors that I pray for, and then there's another one out on the bulletin board in the kitchen. Uh, and then the third one, I've actually, I met when I was in Israel. I didn't, this was not given to me. It was just something God laid on my heart. So every morning when I pick this up, I pray for Sumi, and, uh, Suvi, Sume, and Pastor Corey. Um, so that's, that's, that's how I make a habit of it, okay? When I pick this up, I know where my brain goes. It, it immediately goes to Suvi and Sume and Pastor Corey. All right, so I would challenge you, get involved there. Um, be open to things that God might lay on your heart to help, okay? Don't remain willfully ignorant, okay? When one part of the body hurts, 
the entire body hurts. And I, you'll see some things, man, you get into this, you'll see some things that should make your heart hurt. All right? Okay. Father, we thank you for your word. Father, your son told us that in this life we will face trouble. And then he said, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Help us, Father, to lift up our brothers and sisters in prayer. Strengthen those, Father, that, that refuse to deny you. I pray, Father, that the testimony of their mouth and the testimony, the witness of how they are living their life, even in the midst of persecution, would be a, a blessed witness to their persecutors. That even they might begin to question, what is this faith all about? Father, your word says that if they seek, they will find. And Father, we know that your church grows when it suffers persecution. Father, as we, we <coughs> have this time of rest and peace in the United States, help us not to use it to, to go fat and lazy, Father, but that we would develop in us that, that prayer warrior, that person who loves you so much that when the persecution comes, we will not be moved. We will not be shaken. And, and I just ask God that you would help us to be mindful of all of these things. We pray this, Father, in your Son's name. Amen.